I'm David DiCarlo, member of the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment um, in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering here at UT Austin. Um, a little bit about the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment before we get today's speaker. There's 26 uh, members of the C C C CSEE. Um, at the top left is our um, director, Matt Bailhoff. He can't be here today because he's got to teach class, but he will watch on the video as some of you may do in the in the future here. Um, mainly uh, the, the big, so we, most of us are in the Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, but we've got members at uh, Jackson School of uh, Geosciences, and we've got members in um, Applied Math and other things. So what do we do here at CSEE? We do research to solve some of the problems or some of the issues facing energy and the energy transition going forward. We do it, we basically break out the research on certain applications, certain subsurface applications. Um, traditionally, it's been conventional oil and gas, but recently that's changed a lot. We're into carbon storage, we're into methane hydrates, we're into tight shale and oil and gas is actually our biggest fraction on the top left. Uh, we break this out into specific disciplines. So there's applications, there's disciplines such as reservoir engineering and geomechanics, petrophysics, and we use certain engineering tools to get this work done to do our research here to try to solve some of these problems. Um, a big thing that I like to do is macro scale experiments. And I think Dr. John Olson will be talking about that also today in the context of fracking. So uh, the way we organize this is through um, a lot of our funding comes from government, but a lot of our funding comes from you guys, industrial affiliates, paying attention and, and having particular issues that you want to bring to University of Texas in Austin that we are interested in. Of. A um, whole bunch of different industrial affiliates project projects. The one I'm particularly interested in is gas enhanced oil recovery. But today's speaker is John Olson, who's the leader of FRAC, which is in bold here, Fracture Research and Application Consortium. And he'll be talking about that today. We've got a whole bunch of other ones. If you're interested in any, you can contact me or Dr. Bailhoff in the department. Um, our speaker here is today on the right, but before I get to John Olson, let me tell you about what's going to happen in the future. Um, we have these webinars every Friday afternoon, first Friday of the month, not every Friday, but first Friday of the month at noontime via Teams, which you are on right now. Thank you for attending. Um, after it's done, we're going to upload this to the YouTube channel. So where are we going in the future? Well, this is the first Friday of October. First Friday, November, we're having Drs. Moj Jadelshad and Peter Eichable talk about geological storage of hydrogen. <clears throat> One thing where subsurface may come into big play going in the future of energy. They'll talk about uh, review and insights from numerical simulations. And then in December, we'll have a new member of CSEE, Dr. Arvind Ravakumar. He's going to talk about sustainability within the oil and gas sector, in particular methane and methane um, solving the methane challenge keeping methane in our pipelines, going to where we want it to go, where people can put it to use rather than just having it go out in the environment where it doesn't give us the biggest use. That's all up ahead. Today, though, we have Dr. John Olson. Dr. John Olson is going to be talking about predicting hydraulic fracture geometry in shales, lab experiments, and numerical modeling. Uh, John is currently the department chair of the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. Uh, he's got his degrees from Notre Dame and Stanford University, and if you forget that, he'll remind you that before the talk is over. Um, he's also been uh, he's also been a distinguished lecturer uh, for AAPG and SPE, which has been a big part of the outreach uh, for our department also going forward. So his research expertise, though, is in fracturing and the geomechanics of fracturing and doing experiments on this type of thing. And this is what he's going to talk about today. And I'm very happy to have John Olson present today. John, it's all yours. Thank you, David. I, I, I'm glad you're able to give me some grief about Notre Dame, but we'll have to talk football later. So, um, so I'm John Olson here at the Hildebrand Department and Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment, and I'm going to talk today, as as David said, on um, hydraulic fracture geometry and shales, a little bit about what my group, my graduate students, and I have been doing in experimental and numerical work over the last five to ten years. <clears throat> so um, part of the the 
uniqueness of of my work is I also collaborate with Steve Lawback and um, a bunch of geologists, Julia Gale and others at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Um, actually, one of the upcoming speakers, Peter Eichubel, who's doing the hydrogen storage case. So we have a good mix of engineering and geology in the work that we do. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to I just have a slide to set up context about unconventionals, but um, then I'm going to talk to you about work that we've done on laboratory fracture mechanics testing in the Marcellus Shale. Also some hydrostone block experiments that we've done to kind of look at um, simulated hydraulic fracturing in fractured reservoirs. And I'll wrap up with showing how we've taken these, in, taken these insights into um, creating comp a computationally efficient hydraulic fracturing model that can be used for design and analysis. So as many of you know, I just want to um, set the context here. In US oil and gas, um, shale continues to dominate um, the technology that's really important that we're all interested in in context of today's talk is horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing. And just to show you the importance of shale, if you haven't seen these um, diagrams from the US Im Energy Information Agency, Tide oil is projected to continue to be the dominant source of oil production in the United States, um, somewhere just short of 15 million barrels a day. And in natural gas, it's going to be even a bigger component, although this natural gas chart now includes tight gas as well, which can be low permeability sandstones. But the op opportunities in shales and really tight rocks um, are great for production. And you can see these two, the oil and the shale are actually plotted at the same scale with regard to energy per day. And so you can see that as far as production goes, the United States is significantly more wealthy in gas than they are in oil, even though our consumption is actually greater in oil than it is in gas. But, but the technologies and insights I'm going to talk to you today about are related to shale, either oil or gas. But the example that I'm going to show you um, of some, some actual rocks that we tested is from the Marcellus, which is in the, the shale gas realm. So I'd like to start out just talking about um, hydraulic fracture and natural fracture interaction and some of the insights um, that others have, have, uh, have found and then how we've tried to use that in our work in the lab. So this may be a familiar plot to you. This is from early in the unconventional boom time, or maybe this is kind of just before the boom, a paper by Fisher et al. in 2004. This is a map view, almost a mile by a mile. The treatment well in the middle here, this is a stimulated vertical well in the Barnett Shale, okay? And um, all these little gray dots are microseisms that were recorded from subsurface um, seismometers looking at activity that um, occurred during during the frac job. Okay, and many of you, if you work in the fracturing business, you're very familiar with this. This is kind of the beginning of that, that realm. All these green lines here are inferred fractures that were created during the frac job. And notice, even though in the Barnett, the stress state is aligned such that the preferred fracture direction is northeast southwest, there appears to be this cross fracture pattern that goes in as well. And that that actually um, lines up with the natural fractures in the Barnett. So there's con concrete evidence that that all these microseisms are also related to the fluid coming from the frac job because there are actually five wells that were killed during this treatment because of infiltration of the frac fluid into those wells. And so you can see that the idea of just a single plane symmetric hydraulic fracture really isn't appropriate for how things work in the Barnett Shale. Um, and one of the terminologies that was created back at this time was the stimulated reservoir volume. And in this particular case, the stimulated reservoir volume would be the hydraulically fractured volume, which is about 3,500 feet long in the northeast southwest direction, about a thousand feet wide. Okay. And so back in the in the early days, um, this was considered this complexity of natural fractures is how we are able to get gas out of the shale. In the Permian Basin now, people are thinking that maybe some of this complexity is is um, not as much cross fracturing. Most of the fractures are in a particular alignment, but I'm going to kind of focus on this interaction of hydraulic fractures with natural fractures today and how that can give you this complexity in the geometric pattern that you see. Um, so if you just 
basically go through an animation then of what might happen. Let's say we have our treatment well. This is a map view again of what might happen um, as the hydraulic fracture propagates. The well would be up here to the north. The hydraulic fracture propagates down. It hits a natural fracture. Um, and notice the hydraulic fracture is parallel to the presumed SH max direction here. Um, but when it hits a natural fracture because of the weakness of the natural fracture, the fluid is able to infiltrate that natural fracture and now one fracture has become two and we can go down and basically create this very complex significant surface area in the reservoir. Um, this is an artist's conception of how this can happen and this was really revolutionary thinking of how hydraulic fracturing worked. Um, and um, the thing about it is that revolution actually occurred in the 1980s. So um, you could say nothing is new under the sun, but this is basically work by Warpinski and Teufel working with the GRI, Gas Research Institute, looking at tight gas sandstones and how complexity in hydraulic fracturing in the Peons Basin in Colorado was explained um, um, at that time. So, so it took about really 15 or 20 years for this idea to really be accepted and con so-called confirmed in the shale world, um, partly because of technology of the geophysical um, observations using microseismic. So that kind of sets the context here. So one of the things that we did in our research group with the help of getting some samples from ExxonMobil and um, another Pennsylvania company called PGE, we were able to do some fracture mechanics testing of Marcellus cores. And then we also did some th synthetic rock work as well. So let me just describe that briefly here as the kind of the beginning of our research work. So um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to test vein strength, basically vein being a calcite filled natural fracture in the Marcellus. You can see this is a four inch diameter core and you can see two natural veins um, filled with calcite in this core. Um, so we basically took that sample Normally to create these samples, which we're gonna use, which are for what's called an SCB test, which is a semicircular bending test, you would actually core plug the core. But what we found is the vibration of a coring machine um, basically broke our natural fractures. So we basically had to saw cut all of our samples. And so we basically put a, a, a hexagon on our sample. We cut out the hexagon, cut it in half to get the semicircular bending. Um, when we initially started doing this, we were a little bit worried about these sharp edges and the loading. Um, so we would grind our sample off to be a smooth surface. And then we put it in our um, uniaxial compressive um, frame and um, with loading from the top and then the rollers on the side here, basically we have two pins at the bottom. This would basically load this sample in tension above this notch that you see and we would get a tensile crack that would propagate through the sample. This is a standard ASTM standard test for fracture toughness for rock or other material. Um, we wanted to look at how fractures propagated, not quite so focused on the toughness assessment, although we did that as well. And so what we did was we created these samples and we put natural fractures in the path of this tensile crack that was propagating out of this notch with the idea that that tensile crack is comparable to a hydraulic fracture. It's not fluid driven, but it's the same mode of propagation as a hydraulic fracture. And we wanted to see how that tensile crack would interact with obstructions in the um, Marcellus samples, in this case, the natural veins that we saw there. And so what we did was basically oriented the sample with regard to bedding such that it would mimic a vertical hydraulic fracture. So in this plan view here, we're looking from the top down on the bedding. So the bedding is in the plane of the slide a vertical fracture, a analogous vertical fracture is propagating through the sample. And we looked at veins of various orientations and um, properties to test, to test um, fracture interaction. We did this with Marcellus samples. Prior to that Marcellus work, um, Wei Wei Wang um, did some work with, with myself and Masha Perdonovich on synthetic samples to do a similar thing, but I'm going to talk just about the Marcellus stuff today. So here's a bunch of samples that we created from the Marcellus from this one piece of core. And one of the great things about um, this particular study is we we're able to do multiple tests on the same vein. So we could look at, for instance, in this case, various angles of approach on the exact same vein. So the variation in results we could fairly confidently say had to do with angle of approach, not with the fact that we're looking at different veins. So we had some reproducibility that we could do. 
Um, we also looked at, at thick veins versus thin veins. This is just showing that this particular sample has both of the veins in it, but we are mostly just looking at that vein. And then also um, we were able to create multiple um, samples from various depths in the core to look at, in this case, the different thicknesses of calcite veins and how that impacted um, tensile crack interaction. So let me just talk about the details of those slides. I kind of um, showed you all the samples at once. Now we'll go back and look at it in more detail. So our typical sample was two to four inches in diameter. And so this dimension here on the sample would be two to four inches. The vein thickness varied from 0 0.01 to 0 0.08 um, inches approximately. And what we found was that typically, well, almost exclusively actually, when this tensile crack would come out of the notch and interact with a vein, it would break within the calcite. It wouldn't separate on the boundary of calcite and shale, which normally when you pick core out, you often see that the, that that's a weak point, the bonding between the shale and the calcite. But what we found is that in our experiments, all of the failures were occurring strictly within the calcite, which was kind of interesting. So we took some thin sections of these samples, and this is the, th the same thin section, one in one view in plain polarized light on the left, one view in crossed nickels on the right. And you can see on both sides, you can see this these little dashed or dots that are lines of dots. So those are actually fluid inclusions parallel to this dashed line I just put on here. And it appears that those fluid inclusions represent planes of weakness in these veins in the Marcellus. And, and we think that's the reason why we got crack propagation internal to the um, calcite here um, when we did our interaction experiments. The other thing you can see on the cross nickels is you can see the various crystals of calcite. The crystal boundaries, crystal graphic boundaries, which are different orientations of the crystals, seem to have very little to do with propagation of the tensile cracks within the veins, which was kind of interesting. So let's look at angle of approach results. This is actually a two and a half inch diameter sample. The vein thickness was 0 0.009 inches. And you can see orthogonal approach, slightly oblique, more oblique, and even more oblique. So from um, an approach angle of 90 degrees to an approach angle of 43 degrees. And you can see that crossing was preferred for the more orthogonal case. We had direct crossing here. Um, a little diversion in crossing, and then here we just had complete capture of the tensile crack by the vein for these two higher angle, or excuse me, these two more oblique approach cases. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to look at those results and be able to explain them theoretically with fracture mechanics with the hopes that we can incorporate that into a criterion um, to analyze um, fracture interaction and incorporate that into a numerical model. So if we look at propagation criterion with respect to homogeneous media, we used linear elastic fracture mechanics as our basis. This is a fracture. The fracture tip here um, is where we do most of our analysis and the angle of propagation going ahead of the fracture tip angle theta is the theta is the angle of reference. So zero degrees um, propagation angle would be in plane propagation. And so there's two ways we can look at this from this two-dimensional view. We can either have opening mode crack propagation where basically fluid pressure or tensile um, loading in the case of our samples um, can pry the fracture apart and create a stress concentration of the crack tip. For opening mode, we would describe that as K1, which is the opening mode stress intensity factor. You could also have shear loading on the crack um, and shear loading on the crack with just a shear couple, we would describe that with K2, which is a shearing mode stress intensity factor where the shear is perpendicular to the crack tip. There's a third mode of, of, of um, stress intensity factor re related to out of plane shear here, but I'm just going to stick to this two dimensional description for now. If we combine both of these um, stress intensity factors, we call that mixed mode propagation, and that can cause the fracture path to curve, and, and you'll see some of that in our hydrostone block experiments that I get to after I finish talking about the shale. So in order to do the analysis of that for a for a propagation criterion, we used um, the energy release rate theory. And energy release rate is symbolized by the capital letter G. And um, it is basically the sum of the squares of the two stress intensity factors divided by a um, Young's modulus um, parameter. In this particular case, this is the plane strain 
modulus, which is which is Young's modulus divided by one minus Poisson's ratio. Notice there are bars on top of here, and the bars are coming from the modification of this energy release rate equation by Neusmer from 1975, where he actually allowed for mixed mode loading. So you can see this K1 bar is actually a combination of both K1, the mode one stress intensity factor, and K2 in this equation, and K2 bar similarly. And that this, I'm not going to go into the details of where these equations are derived, but these come from basically um, fracture, fracture tip analysis in linear elastic fracture mechanics. And so we can characterize the energy release rate. So basically looking at mechanical energy turning into surface energy by propagating the crack and decide when the crack is going to propagate and at what angle. And what we find is the fracture is, is theoretically um, proposed to follow the path of maximum energy release rate. And so we can plot, make a plot of that energy release rate versus propagation angle for pure mode one, just to simplify things here. So basically for this plot, I've essentially eliminated K, the K2 terms by setting K2 equal to zero. And you can see K1 bar depends on one plus cosine and K2 bar depends on sine um, internally. And then they also have a cosine out here. And you can see then if we looked at where this curve is maximum, K1 bar is the blue curve here, which is a maximum at theta equals zero. K2 bar, which is a shear component, is a maximum at plus or minus approximately um, 70 degrees. And so if we look at that, Think about our sample in the laboratory. If it propagates straight ahead, theta equals zero, we can see the dashed green line here is the energy release rate line. So we expect energetically the most efficient place to propagate is straight ahead, in plane propagation. But I'm going to talk to you about whether fractures propagate along pre existing weaknesses. And so in this particular case, that pre existing weakness is orthogonal to um, the in plane propagation or at theta equals 90. And you can see, if you look at the likelihood of propagation to go in this direction, it's much less likely than straight ahead because energetically it's less efficient for a homogeneous media. And so we had to look at that energy analysis and try and decide, um, you may have already guessed what we tried to decide, but try to decide how do we, how do we, um, how could we explain fractures being diverted along natural fractures? And as you may, as you may suspect, fractured media and this media that we're talking about in the Marcellus is not homogeneous. And so the shale actually has a different strength than the veins do. And we tried to in incorporate that into our analysis. And so this is um, to take that propagation analysis go one and go one step further. Here's a hydraulic fracture. It's approaching to intersect a natural fracture. Here's this plot of the energy release rate versus angle. Straight ahead is zero degrees. You can see the energy release rate is maximum at zero degrees, and it goes to zero out here at 180 degrees, where theta is measured, theta equals zero is straight ahead propagation. But we have two lines on here. One is the critical energy release rate for propagation for the intact rock, so that would be our Marcellus shale. And one of them is a is the critical energy release rate for the vein. And what I've shown you here in this particular case is to imagine the natural fracture critical energy release rate or the natural fracture strength is one half of the rock matrix. And so if we look then at um, what, how would this impact our fra fracture propagation, in order for the cemented natural fracture to fail, diversion occurs when the G along the diverted path exceeds the critical value of G before the G along the straight ahead path exceeds the critical value of G for intact rock. And so basically we're looking at the ratio of G described by the loading divided by the critical value for natural fractures. Um, we divert along a natural fracture if that ratio is greater than G over G rock. Okay, and so imagine then we're looking at the crack tip. Here's our curve of G straight ahead, G over G crit, you can see that's actually a less than one, a ratio of less than one, so we haven't reached the critical value yet. But even though we haven't reached the critical value for the shale, the um, critical value for failure and propagation has been reached for the natural fracture along this path of theta equals approximately minus 65 degrees, okay? And so the analysis then says that the as this crack tip approaches this fracture, 
the fracture is not going to cross the natural fracture. It's going to divert along the natural fracture based on energetic analysis in a inhomogeneous media. Um, it could also propagate to the left um, along the other part of the natural fracture, but you can see if we look at that, that's at 120 degrees and the energetics of that is actually below failure. And so we expect the crack to only propagate in one direction along the along the natural fracture. And if you look at one of our samples from the Marcellus, that's exactly what we saw in the laboratory. We saw propagation only in one direction. The fracture didn't fail. The, the pre-existing vein didn't fail everywhere. It just failed in the direction of most favorable energy um, direction. So, so that weaker vein is able to basically capture capture the um, capture the propagation of the tensile crack. And if you see, if we if we were to lower this theta angle to be closer and closer to in-plane propagation, that energetics um, gets higher and higher. And so, the more um, the smaller the angle of theta, the more likely we are to divert along the natural fracture. Okay, so. I think what I've just shown, oh, excuse me, I left I left out one thing here. Um, so the smaller theta is, the less likely we are to divert, the less likely we are to divert orthogonal um, propagation. So if, if theta equals 90 degrees, that's our lowest energetics, um, but still positive. And so that's the least likely case for diversion, the most likely case for crossing as far as our possible angles. So orthogonal approach is theoretically most likely for the crack to propagate. You can see here's an example of one of our experiments where we did get propagation straight across like I showed you already. But one of the things that's missing in this, in our um, theoretical analysis, excuse me, is the thickness of this vein. And so we investigated that by looking at various veins of varying thickness. So 0 0.01 was our example of crossing, 0 0.035 we got kind of oblique crossing, but still crossing. But when we had really thick veins, we saw that we got diversion, even though that energetically from the fracture, fracture mechanics analysis, it looked like that was not a favorable thing to happen. The fracture mechanics analysis does not account for thickness, okay? And many of you know, the larger a sample is, the, the more um, flaws it can contain and the more likely it is to fail. So we think these thicker and thicker veins actually gave us an opportunity for more and more flaws to be embedded in the calcite. And maybe that's one of the reasons why um, thicker veins were more likely to fail even in orthogonal approach cases, whereas the thin veins we had tensile crack crossing. And all of this work um, on the Marcellus is, is nicely described in a Journal of Geophysical Research paper by um, Hunju Lee, um, my former PhD student um, and postdoc who's now a professor at o Oklahoma State. So just to summarize this real quick, um, we just de demonstrated that well cemented veins, rocks that were intact, um, were able to vein um, fail on along the veins as planes of weakness. Approach angle had a big impact. We actually quantified fracture toughness for the calcite versus the shale, and we found that the calcite actually had a slightly higher fracture toughness than the shale did which might make you think, well, the, the veins are very are less likely to fail than the shale. But what we found when you take into account energy release rate, which is not just fractured toughness, it's toughness squared be, divided by Young's modulus, we found that um, the veins actually had one quarter of the um, energy release rate critical value than the shale. And that's because the veins, the calcite is much, much stiffer than the shale. And so we divide by that stiffer Young's modulus and we get a lower value for G crit for the for the veins than the shale. And so so it's not just the strength as as um, quantified by fracture toughness that impacts propagation. It's also the stiffness of the veins compared to the shale that makes a difference. And also, like I showed in that last slide, the not just stiffness, but also thickness of the veins needs to be taken into account. Okay, so that's some desktop unconfined tests um, where pure tensile loading um, were used to, to examine the um, propagation. We thought, well, let's, let's at least do some fluid-driven experiments. So we did some small-scale hydraulic fracture experiments with, with hydrostone blocks. Um, we did have confinement, but it was low confinement, but I think these are still instructive. So hydrostone is basically a gypsum-based cement. Um, we had a plexiglass form. We would basically embed natural fractures in our form. We'd pour the gypsum cement. It's really like working with plaster, but it's stronger and stiffer. And we'd also embed our wellbores in the, in the um, 
form as well. So we have a horizontal, or actually this is a vertical well bore. We're going to propagate a hydraulic fracture and look at its interaction with these um, natural fractures. We did various patterns. Um, the pictures, when we were taking pictures, when we just started these experiments, we're using glass slides. We decided that was a bad idea. Glass is too strong compared to the hydrostones. So then we started using plaster, preformed plaster plates as our natural fractures. The load frame was essentially an aluminum box with flat jacks in it. And so we could have two independent horizontal stress directions. And then there was a flat jack under the lid to give us the vertical stress direction. So we could have three independent stress magnitudes. Um, those were all pumped up by air from um, the house air in our laboratory. And then we had our well bore line coming in where we pumped our fluid. And this is all like nicely described in an SPE paper by Ben Bohorich, who was a master's student working with me um, a few years ago. Once we're done with the experiments, we basically played Michelangelo and, and um, chiseled the block open to discover the um, fracture geometry. And here's one of the examples that was kind of a surprise to us, but in in hindsight shouldn't have been. Um, but you know, all the diagrams I've shown you so far prior to showing this block, everything's in two dimensions. And so a fracture is a line, and if a hydraulic fracture approaches that line, it's going to hit it. Well, the real world is three dimensional. And so here's our well bore. Those are our perforations. The die is the um, from the fracturing fluids. You see this hydraulic fracture propagated out from the well bore. And here's this obstruction of the natural fracture, but it's actually the natural, the natural fracture is not as tall as the hydraulic fracture. So the hydraulic fracture didn't really break and cross the natural fracture. It actually went around it. Okay. And so that was another thing that that this very simple experiment taught us is um, it's important to know the relative scale of your fractures when you're looking at this. And in some cases we have crossing and in some cases we actually have bypass, which I would call this bypass. And you can see on the right hand side, it's completely bypassed. On the left hand side, the, the two bypassing wings, upper and lower wings, haven't quite reconnected yet um, prior to us stopping the experiment. So here's another example of a more complex interaction. So here's our well bore in the block. Okay, this is a foot by a foot by a foot block. Vertical well bore, again, it, it's easier to do than the horizontal well bore cases. So those were our first experiments. Going down here into the block, um, here's the natural fracture, which was a plate of preformed plaster. And this is just a, a little bit um, more um, bird's eye view of that same case. There's the same well bore. This is the same block. Here's the natural fracture. The angle is about 120 degrees. Fracturing fluid propagated a hydraulic fracture until it hit the natural fracture, diverted along the natural fracture, and then continued to propagate on just one end of the wing here, okay? Um, and you can see again in, in the main drawing, you can see this, we have the hydraulic fracture come out. We have some bypass where the fluid is going below the, the natural fracture, but then also we have diversion along the natural fracture that kinks off in the end in the end. Now, this is a little bit different than our Marcellus experiments with cemented, um, veins that we got pro propagation going in both directions. But what we found is the bonding between our plaster natural fracture and the hydrostone was really, really weak. And so it's easier to break than uh, the bonding between calcite and Marcellus. And so that's why we think we got propagation in both directions. But notice continued propagation was just in one side of that natural fracture. If I remove this side of the block just to give you a better view, hopefully you can understand how this worked better. Here's the well bore. This is the same block. It's about a foot across, although I've chopped off part of the block here. There's the perforations. You can see fluid driv drove a hydraulic fracture out. Here's the bypassing hydraulic fracture that went below our natural fracture. There's a diversion along the natural fracture and continued propagation. So we went from one planar crack into two planar cracks as they move beyond um, this natural fracture obstruction. So that was very instructive to us on um, basically crack path curving going on, diversion of fluid along the natural fracture, and also bypass. So, so we're trying to incorporate all of that three-dimensional complexity into our modeling. As you may know, if you've done modeling, full, fully three-dimensional modeling can be challenging. Um, but we're trying to move those insights into our modeling. And let me just describe, to wrap up the presentation here, let me describe our modeling efforts um, briefly. So the base code that we started with was a two-dimensional displacement discontinuity code. So basically, 
each element, this is this is the linear portion is the element. These big circles I drew on here are basically the joints or the joining of the elements along a fracture. We solve for what's going on at the cracked tip and we look at propagation by adding elements um, to the model. OK, displacement discontinuity basically allows for opening on the fracture elements as well as shearing on the fracture elements. And this mixed mode propagation I talked about where there's both shearing and opening gives us this um, um, gives us this, uh, can give us this curving path like we saw in the hydrostone experiments. So the progression of this modeling, um, one of the advantages of 2D is it's computationally efficient. Unfortunately, 2D is not appropriate for three-dimensional fractures. And what this shows here is normalized aperture, um, aperture as the fracture grows, so width over initial width, or a non, excuse me, width, yeah, width over initial width versus normalized fracture length, where the fracture length is normalized by the height of the fracture. And so what you see is when um, for the two dimensional fracture, fracture opening just continues to grow as fracture length gets larger for, um, this is for a uniform pressure um, boundary condition. In a three dimensional fracture, once the fracture length equals approximately the fracture height, you've reached the maximum aperture. And the minimum dimension of the crack from then on for constant pressure cases controls the aperture. And so you get a maximum aperture and it doesn't grow anymore um, once you've got a fracture length that exceeds the fracture height of the, of the sample. Okay, And you can see basically fracture aperture growth quits about after a normalized length of about two. Okay, So what I would say is if you're trying to model hydraulic fractures in the real world, they're three dimensional. So there's a significant error you can make by using the inappropriate model if you do two dimensional modeling for three dimensional hydraulic fractures. So um, we wanted to still use our two dimensional model though because it's so um, computationally efficient. And so we basically um, came up with the algebraic correction factor that we could use in that modeling. And I'm not showing the full set of equations. I'm just showing the correction factor here. And unfortunately, I also called that G. I apologize for that. Let's let's. But that's not energy release rate. That's a correction factor G. Um, and it's just a simple algebraic formula, which depends on the opening or the distance um, between cracks and the height of the crack. And what we found is for um, a um, three-dimensional crack of limited height, you can see the as the aperture grows, it plateaus um, at some constant value under uniform pressure loading after a normalized fracture length, L over H of about two. And um, the three-dimensional reference solution is the line and the triangles are the two-dimensional code, two-dimensional plane, plane strength code with correction factor. And so basically at no computational cost, we were able to upgrade our 2D model into a 3D model um, by using this correction factor. So we're very excited about that. And that was really a big step in our modeling effort. OK. Um, the problem was when we took cases, and this is a cross-sectional view of three hydraulic fractures that are closely spaced, we found that crack interaction for multiple crack cases um, generated um, significant errors when we used our pseudo 3D model, which is the 2D plus correction factor. And that's what P3D is supposed to stand for here. Um, and we found that it, the pseudo our pseudo 3D model over predicted opening, which meant it under predicted mechanical interaction. You can see here for these open squares are the exterior fatter cracks in this three crack example. And you can see there's about a 25% error going from our pseudo 3D model to the reference 3D solution for closely spaced cracks. And, and the interior crack is even um, a bigger error, almost a 50% error. And so basically we said, well, we need to improve on this. Um, but what would be the cost? Well, the problem is three-dimensional modeling is about 15 times slower than two-dimensional displacement discontinuity modeling for the same number of elements. And that's what's shown here on this plot, Computa computational time log scale in seconds for a particular fracture problem to solve for the opening um, for given boundary conditions versus number of elements in the fracture length direction. And you can see that the 2D model is about 15 times faster than the 3D model. That's not all though. To get an accurate solution in 3D, and this is relative error versus number of elements in the height direction for the 3D solution, you need about 10 times the number of elements 
10 rows of elements in the vertical direction in order to get an accurate, accurate solution. So the 3D model is not only 15 times slower for the same number of elements, it also requires 10 times more elements to solve the same problem. And so then if we look at that, we go from 20 elements for a 2D model, for instance, to 200 elements to solve the same crack in 3D. That means that it's actually 1500 times slower. The 3D model is actually 1500 times slower than our 2D model. I know there's lots of supercomputers out there and such, but, but when we're talking about multi-crack problems, computational time is still important, okay? And so this basically shows the potential cost of going to 3D. Um, we wanted to improve on that. And so what we did was, and this is Khan Wu, um, one of my PhD students who's now a professor, associate professor at um, Texas A&M. Um, we created a simplified 3D model to reduce computation time. And we only discretized the 3D model in length. So we only had one row of elements, which I just showed you creates big errors in the 3D solution. Um, but we basically introduced some correction factors to fix those errors. The other thing we did was we required all the fractures are vertical dip, and so we could eliminate all of the dip slip shear equations from the 3D model. So we actually simplified the 3D analysis. And so getting rid of the rows of elements required for the true 3D model, it's going from, you know, let's say a 10 by 10 matrix to just a 10 by one matrix um, in order to describe the fracture. And then, these correction factors, so this one row of elements, which with the normal 3D equations would introduce significant error. We added our correction factors in a similar fashion to what we did in the 2D model. And we were able to get, again, perfect match between the true 3D model, which is um, the dashed line for the outer crack and the solid red line for the inner crack in this three cat case. And the open symbols are our simplified 3D model. OK, and so we simplified the model and got accurate solutions. Now, what was the savings in computational cost? Well, the savings in computational cost was on the order of a factor of 500. OK, and so that's a factor of 500 in savings. So we still have a much, much faster model. It's slower than the 2D simplified model, but it's much, much faster. OK, so um, that's the basis of the modeling that we're doing Currently, simplified 3D modeling. I'll talk to you a little bit about um, a couple things that we've added to that. Our initial simplified 3D model had to have constant height, um, and it didn't have height growth. And so um, Tiffany Lee, a master's student, actually added that to the modeling and added it in a three-layer um, stress case. And so she allowed for variable height of the elements as you move along the fracture length and also allowed for us to have variable stress from layer to layer. It's still a homogeneous elastic body, but we can have layers and stress. And we verified all this against, um, again, the fully 3D model, which I don't think I said before, but the fully 3D model our work is based on is a, a, a dissertation by Shu who worked with um, Crouch at the University of Minnesota. Another thing that was a limitation of our simplified model was all of the cracks had to have their centers on the same horizontal plane. Well, Tiffany also worked on that and basically allowed, um, came up with modified correction factors. So we still just have one row of elements, but we can get accurate solutions even when we have some fractures that are in um, different, their centers are at different depths than other fractures. And this you might imagine if you have dipping beds or if you have a horizontal well that's moving um, through the, uh, uh, the reservoir at different widths. And these two plots, um, this shows the match between the reference solution, which is a dashed line and the open symbols. Without our correction factor for um, 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 allowing for this different um, locations of the centers of the crack and with our correction factor. So actually, and this is in Tiffany's, or a paper by Tiffany and um, Omid Razavi that we presented at, um, I think at ARMA in 2018. OK, and so so this is a basis, the 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 three simplified 3D model um, allowing for three dimensional arrangement of the fractures with regard to having different um, vertical locations for their centers and also allowing fracture height growth. Um, and then um, my current student, Zhao Chen Wang, is working on taking all of those models and moving it back into the case of um, um, active dynamic propagation of multiple fractures simultaneously. And so you can see up here, he did a case of a horizontal well with just um, 
fractures in a non-fractured media. Down here, we've got natural fractures um, that the hydraulic fractures are intersecting. And um, I'll just show show um, the case. We're basically using um, the modified Renshaw criterion for fracture crossing down in this particular case. And we also have multiple stress layers which are impacting the fracture height growth. And you can see um, the horizontal well would have been going through here in the top case through the middle. You can see we have limited or restricted height growth um, where the cracks are closest together. And as the hydraulic fractures move away from the well bore, we get a little bit more height growth. Um, you also see height growth and development of aperture. The yellow is larger aperture than the blue, and this is showing the 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 ability of us to to basically predict predict fracture height growth and propagation and interaction um, in frac design mode. Um, I'm going to stop here as far as as things to talk about, but I just want to say that this code of Zhao Chen's, um, which I'll hopefully you saw his presentation at the ATCE last week, but he basically has a way to run this. Well, it's built in MATLAB and you can actually optimize fracture spacing, perforation cluster location, and other treatment parameters to try and generate the greatest amount of surface area in the reservoir. So he actually has a hydraulic fracture optimization code that he's built based on all this theory that I've been talking about. Okay, so to wrap up, um, I talked a little bit about benchtop experiments, looking at Marcellus Shale, and I think we discovered some interesting parameters that are important for you to know about if you're looking at the idea of hydraulic fractures interacting with natural fractures. Our hydrostone work and our SCB work um, confirmed some of those, or excuse me, our SCB work showed um, how um, the strength of the natural fractures and their geometry is important for incorporating cemented veins into modeling. Um, I didn't write it here, but our, our um, hydrostone block experiments also reminded us of the importance of three-dimensionality. Um, and then I wanna say about modeling, I mean, I showed you some models, there's some, there some pretty pictures there, but modeling's a really crowded field and there's a lot of people um, that are working on this. And what I would like to say, I feel like um, we're making advances in a particular niche which is basically this simplified displacement discontinuity approach. We're trying to use this innovation of using correction factors to get accurate 3D solutions, but also cut down on computation time. Um, and we've shown that these are accurate solutions. And the idea that we've got this energy, or excuse me, energy, this computationally efficient model means that in Zhao Chen's work, um, we can actually do optimization um, work. And so I think in order, in order to do optimization work, you really need to have an efficient model. So it's almost 12.50, so I'm gonna stop um, in order to give you a chance to ask questions. If the fracture diverts along a vein, what criterion then would it propagate again into the preferred direction? I see how it diverts, but how does it jog? Um, so this is some work that, that another student of mine, Arash Dahi, has worked on. We, we call it um, kinking back into the shale. So if the fracture gets diverted along, the hydraulic fracture gets diverted along a vein, when is it going to decide that it's going to quit propagating along the vein and move back out? Um, in our hydrostone experiments, it showed, and that was very weak bonding between the natural fracture and the matrix. In our hydrostone experiments, um, the fluid went all the way to the end of the natural fracture and then kinked off at the end. So, so the maximum amount of diversion you can have is the length of the natural fracture. Um, now, in, in real natural fractures, that length can be significant. Um, and so what Arash has done is to use that same um, that same uh, energy release rate criterion to, to find that eventually um, the misalignment of the fracture um, changes the energy conditions such that the crack will eventually want to kink back. Um, I can't say more than that right now without having to draw and write down a bunch of things. So, um, so Arash's work basically showed, again, here's... Um, the follow-up from Steve, Arash's work showed that it will kink back under certain conditions. Um, I don't have a reference for that. Um, I can't remember exactly where that is, but but um, I would have referenced you to Dahi, papers by Dahi, and and um, maybe if Arash is here, he can, he can help me out afterwards and we'll send you an email. Okay, um, anonymous question. How representative are experiments on vertical wells with longitudinal fractures to horizontal wells with transversely oriented fractures? Um, so I'll publish that question. So the represented the, the 
the vertical well geometry that we used is not representative of what happens near the wellbore for fracture initiation. As far as once the fracture gets away from the wellbore and it's interacting with the natural fractures, I would say it's perfectly analogous. And so our laboratory work was really focused on that fracture-fracture interaction, looking at one hydraulic fracture interacting with one natural fracture and how that might develop into multiple fractures. So I think that's perfectly analogous whether the initiation of the fracture was a vertical well or a horizontal well. If you wanted to look at, and this is something that we found challenging to get multiple initiation of transverse fractures in horizontal well, if you wanted to look at the impact of cluster spacing or competition of simultaneously parallel fractures, um, then yes, I would really need to have a horizontal well as my basis. But for the fracture-fracture interaction case, I don't think that's a limitation at all. Does your numerical model assume simultaneous initiation of all fractures? Um, if so, how would potential non-simultaneous fracture initiation impact it? Um, the final geometry. Um, so this is in reference to Zhao Chen's work at the end where he's doing, simul he's doing simultaneous um, uh, multiple fractures. Um, I think if if you had basically what he does in order to create the so-called perforation cluster, he puts little starter cracks in there. And so we don't literally model the wellbore and the perforations. We put starter cracks in, but we do model the fluid flow from perf cluster to perf cluster to take into account the pressure drop in the wellbore, which modifies the pressure and fluid rate delivered to each um, fracture cluster. Um, but I do think in, in answer to your question, if we did have somehow some delay of initiation from one perf cluster to another, that could further enhance or, or further exacerbate the um, unequal growth of um, multiple fractures from a particular stage of hydraulic fracturing. But our context has been limited entry, and so we're presuming um, as a as an initial state of our, our modeling that we have good enough limited entry that it, so that the crack initiates at every perf cluster. And then once they're initiated, then it's totally, um, so we we prescribe that there's a fracture, fracture initiated, but then how it grows is entirely guided by the physics. And so, so there could be some more there um, if it's hard to get cracks to grow. Um, but um, but that's that's the level that um, that we have analyzed it. Have you conducted benchtop experiments in hydrostone where the injection wall model um, was horizontal with multiple clusters as done in today's completion? Um, we have done those experiments. Um, I had a master's student. Um, it's but several years ago now um, that worked on that. And one of the problems we had was we weren't getting good. Um, cement integrity around our well bores, and so what we found is that that we would put in perforations, which we could um, mold into the block pretty well. But what we got was we got leakage of the fluid along the interface or the microannulus between the well bore and the and the hydrostone, and so we kept getting longitudinal crack initiation. And so so basically we were we were plagued by bad cement jobs. And um, the student that was working in hydrostone eventually had to graduate, and so we had to had to move on. And then um, Andreas Michael um, moved from hydrostone into um, a polymer-based approach, and we still had some issues with um, fracture initiation, but he's actually published a paper in JPSE looking at some of that. But I've been, I don't feel like we've gotten a great result um, with um, simultaneous uh, hydraulic fractures in hydrostone in our laboratory, but there are others who have, have done it and been more successful than us. But um, that's a point that I would like to return to, but we haven't done hydrostone experiments for a couple years now. Um, there seems to be a different numerical models method used by industry in various hydraulic fractures. Uh, is there an agreement benchmark of adopting a standard model? Um, well, like I said, it's a crowded field. We've got um, Mark McClure is probably some of his work is is maybe more similar to mine in that he's using displacement discontinuity, but he's using different numerical tools for solving it in different ways to describe it. And um, his model is... Um, got some additional bells and whistles from what where we're at um, with the uh, Zhao Chen's work. But um, but that that dis displacement discontinuity is a boundary element type of modeling. I, I personally think for high accuracy modeling, I like that the best, better than, for instance, finite element modeling, because in finite element modeling, you have to not only discretize the fracture, but you also have to discretize the body. 
Um, a lot of the design models that people are using are simplified models, and there's there's a variety of people. And and actually, um, I haven't read McClure's latest paper, but he may be in that realm. But there's um, but I, what I was going to say, the work by Donsov, which is coming out of some of the work um, by people like De Tournay and um, um, shoot. Um, the guy at ETH, I'm not remembering his name now, but but there's some simplified modeling going on. Also, Andy Bunger has been working in that, um, and they've really focused on um, simple numerical models and um, sophisticated crack tip solutions. Um, although Bunger has done some some um, more sophisticated modeling as well. Um, I feel like our approach is we want to have a computationally efficient model that allows us to put lots of fractures in, and we're basically saying that we can get by with homogeneous mechanical properties and still see interesting results. So I probably waffled too long on the answer of that question. Let me, I forgot to publish it, but um, sorry if I didn't give you a good answer to that. So we see, lo see longitudinal growth when we conduct diagnostics quite a bit, um, which questions the limited entry concept working at tight cluster spacing. Not sure if we can replicate the same in a numerical model. Um, yeah, I think I mean my my feeling about ages ago back in the in the 90s at Mobile's research lab when I worked with people like Dwayne Yuri and Wadud El Raba, we were doing hydrostone experiments and we did a lot well and, and Wadud did some of that at Halliburton too, but we saw a lot of challenge between getting orthogonal initiation and trans um, um, longitudinal initiation. So I feel like it's probably, you know, I do feel like it is true. Well, I mean, I mean, you're telling me it's true that there is some issue with longitudinal initiation. Um, I wrote a paper back in 1995 that that talked about, depending on how long that initiation is, how would how how severe would the curvature of the fracture be as it realigned. Um, so I think I think there's some interesting things to do there. I think once the hydraulic fracture, if it if it initiates longitudinally. Once it gets a lot bigger than the diameter of the wellbore, then it sees the in situ stress field more than the wellbore stress field. And so then it will curve out and realign itself to be appropriately parallel to SH max as it curves towards that, that realm. So, so fracture initiation in a horizontal wellbore, I think, is still a very interesting topic where there's work to do. Um, recommendations you give to industry. That's a tough question, but I mean, I really think that that um, the modeling is helpful as well as the experiments. Um, I think the challenge with the experiments is what scale do you look at and and what so problem are you solving? I think if you if you do a model, if you do a model that's um, appropriate for fracture initiation around the wellbore, that's not the right scale for looking at how um, fractures interact with natural fractures away from the wellbore. So um, so I think there's a lot of a work to do there. I think, you know, some of the coring experiments have been incredible amounts of data, although even with the incredible amount of data that comes from those coring experiments, like the things in Permian and stuff, there's still a lot of uncertainty. So, um, so hopefully that gives us modelers some space to operate in to uh, hopefully discover some new things that are useful. So I think, um, I think that about wraps up. Thank you so much for your attention and um, all the questions. Thank you all. Thank you for your time.